why don't we get started? Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tammy Gaskell. I'm the director at the Rojan Library. And this program is brought to you by the Columbia County Library Association. So I assume many of you are from some of the other libraries in the county. I'm very happy to welcome Melissa Daly tonight, who is a park ranger at the Martin Van Buren National Historic Site. And she's going to talk to us tonight about Washington Irving and his relationship to Linden Wild. So um, just so you know, this is a webinar for, format. We are recording it. Um, so we'll have the link that we can share with you later. Um, and you are all muted. If you have questions, just put them in the chat and we'll answer the questions at the end. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. Okay. Okay. It's all you, Melissa. Oh, am I on? <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa. I'm a park guide in Martin Van Buren National Historic Site. Um, and I, hi. I want to get started. Um, like, uh, like Tammy said, please put any questions as we go in the chat so you don't forget them. Uh, and then we'll go over at the end. We'll have time to talk about it. So I'm going to get started here with my slideshow. Okay, so I wanna start with our land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship and being forced from here today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Okay, so tonight I'll be talking about Martin Van Buren National Historic Sites connections to Hudson Valley legend, Washington Irving, who is of course uh, very popular at this time of year. Irving's primary residence was Sunnyside down in Terrytown, uh, which is now known as Sleepy Hollow. I'm guessing many of you all probably already know the beginning of this story, but the rest of it may be new to you. So let's dive in. In 1809, Irving was 26 years old and working as a lawyer in Manhattan. He'd had some success as a writer, most notably with the satirical literary magazine, Salmagundi. In February of 1809, a life-changing tragedy struck Washington Irving lost his beautiful young fiance, 17 year old Matilda Hoffman. Quote, nothing was thought of it at the time, Irving said, but she grew rapidly worse and fell into a consumption. Heartsick, the young writer fled Manhattan for the country, spending two months in the handsome brick mansion of his friend, William Van Ness in Kinderhook. This castle, as Irving called it in his letters, is of course now known as Lindenwald. If you visited Martin, Martin Van Buren National Historic Site, you know this mansion well. Irving found solace in writing, uh, quote, by constantly exercising his mind, never suffering it to prey upon itself. And so he delved into the writing, reimagining a book idea he'd been working on. After his two months in Kinderhook, he had written much of what would become his first book, A History of New York, From the Beginning of the World to the End of the Dutch Dynasty by Diedrich Knickerbocker. This lovely Thomas Cole painting, View on the Catskill, captures uh, the romance and beauty of the Hudson Valley in these days. Irving, in a letter to poor Matilda's mother, expressed the comfort that he found while in Kinderhook. I feel so contented here, so quiet. Life seems to flow so smoothly in the country without even a ripple to disturb the current that I could almost float with the stream and glide insensibly through existence. It was also during this time in Kinderhook that Irving met the local schoolmaster, who many believe to be the model for Ichabod Crane's character in Sleepy Hollow. Irving thought this schoolmaster, Jesse Merwin, was, quote, a pleasant, good-natured fellow with much native, unimproved shrewdness and considerable humor. 
Merwin told his friend many tales from his life as they fished in the Kinderhook Creek or ambled about the village. Uh, Irving recounts some of their youthful japes in a letter to Merwin that he wrote in 1851, looking back. Quote, your letter was indeed most welcome, calling up as it did the recollection of pleasant scenes and pleasant days passed together in times long since at Judge Van Ness's in Kinderhook. So there's been many versions of Ichabod Crane over the two centuries since the character was created. Uh, which version looks most like your Ichabod Crane? So I have here uh, an illustration from 1899 by Frederick Simpson Coburn. That's the black and white one. And then next to that, Norman Rockwell's version from 1937. And in the top right corner, actor Tom Meissen from the Fox television series, Sleepy Hollow. And below him, of course, Johnny Depp from Tim Burton's 1999 movie. And the cartoon version voiced by Bing Crosby from 1949. Whichever your version is for many people, including for Martin Van Buren, it was Kinderhook schoolmaster, Jesse Merwin. The president wrote this letter in support of Merwin in 1846. And Washington Irving himself kept up a lifelong correspondence with Merwin. Um, and uh, charmingly, Merwin named one of his sons after Washington Irving. So despite the fact that they knew a lot of the same people, it'll be another two decades until Martin Van Buren and Washington Irving actually meet, uh, mostly because Irving spent 17 of those 20 years living abroad and becoming a literary celebrity in Europe, while Martin Van Buren began his rapid climb up the political ladder. They did have a lot in common. They were the same age. They shared, as I said, many friends and acquaintances. And Van Buren's wife, Hannah, had died at age 33 in 1819 of tuberculosis, the same terrible consumption that had taken Irving's fiance, Matilda. Irving never remarried after, the, or never married after the loss of Matilda, and Martin Van Buren never remarried and remained a widower. But they had uh, separate lives that they pursued until they collided in London in 1831. What happened is in 1829, Van Buren was the Secretary of State for President Jackson. He still hadn't met Washington Irving, but he was really impressed by his reputation. So he wrote a letter to Irving and offered him a position with the legation in London, which is like the embassy. So uh, Irving takes the position as secretary to the minister of London. Uh, two years later, there's uh, this big political scandal that happens in uh, Jackson's, uh, Jackson's presidency, which is the Petticoat Affair, which is a really fascinating episode that really needs its own webinar. But after the, in the aftermath of the Petticoat Affair, Van Buren resigned from Jackson's cabinet. And so Jackson appointed him minister to England. So after these two men had been orbiting each other for years, they finally met when Van Buren arrived in London in September of 1831. Upon meeting Van Buren, Irving wrote to the previous minister, who was a mutual friend, Louis McLean, I have just seen Mr. Van Buren, and I do not wonder you should all be so fond of him. His manners are most amiable and ingratiating, and I have no doubt he will become a favorite at this court. Martin Van Buren was no less impressed and wrote to Andrew Jackson that fall. Washington Irving has been staying some weeks in my house and will I hope continue to do so through the winter. I have been pleased to find in him not only great capacity, but an active and untiring disposition for the prompt and successful charge of business. He says uh, also, I'm quite sure that a better American or a more honest man does not live. Very high praise. They became fast friends. Uh, not only were they living together in London, but they also took a rambling winter tour of central England in December with Martin Van Buren's second son, John. Uh, from a letter that Irving wrote to his brother, Peter, quote, I had a most delightful tour with Mr. Van Buren and his son, whom I have found admirable traveling companions. They visited Oxford, Stratford, Derby, Nottingham, uh, sorry, Stratford-on-Avon, Newstead Abbey and Balborough Hall, where they stayed a fortnight enjoying a complete old English Christmas. 
He is one of the gentlest and most amiable men I have ever met. So eventually Van Buren did have to return to Washington because the Senate rejected his nomination that Jackson had appointed him, uh, mostly due to the machinations of the then vet vice president, John Calhoun. Uh, John Calhoun was sort of estranged from the Jackson, uh, from Jackson at the time. And he uh, made it sort of a mission for him to keep Van Buren's nomination from being confirmed in the Senate. But this move backfires because what happens is Jackson decides eventually to replace Calhoun with Van Buren in his next election as his running mate. This is a great political cartoon from 1832, a piece of the cartoon. This is a lithograph that depicts President Jackson carrying uh, Van Buren. And uh, it says on it, we can never make him president without making him vice president. Uh, in a letter to his brother, Peter, Washington Irving recounts how he had advised Martin Van Buren to return to the court the very day he learned of the Senate vote that failed to confirm him as minister. Quote, I advised him to take the field and show himself superior to the blow leveled at him. And Martin Van Buren did just that. He found that he had lost no face in the eyes of the world. In fact, most people considered that Van Buren was the injured party and had been unfairly treated. When the London Times reported that Martin Van Buren's acts to date would be void as minister, Irving demanded and received a retraction from the newspaper on Van Buren's behalf. Irving predicted Martin Van Buren's rise to the White House, musing, quote, I should not be surprised if this vote of the Senate goes far towards ultimately elevating him to the presidential chair. So they both soon returned to the United States and they continued to correspond and spend time together, even taking a multi-week tour of the Hudson Valley in October, 1833 via carriage much like their earlier Christmas journey in England the year before. Uh, Washington Irving writes again to his brother, Peter, quote, I made a delightful journey with Mr. Van Buren in an open carriage from Kinderhook to Poughkeepsie, then crossed the river to the country about the foot of the Catskill Mountains. And so from uh, Isopus by Goshen, Haverstraw, Tappan, Hackensack to Communipaw, an expedition which took two weeks to complete in the course of which we visited curious old Dutch places and Dutch families. The two also continued to exchange political opinions and advice and Irving even wrote some partisan newspaper pieces to bolster the Democratic Party. Uh, despite the fact that Washington Irving never married and had no children of his own, he became the caretaker and benefactor for generations of his family. His brother, Peter, moved into Sunnyside in 1836. And after the panic of 1837, uh, his brother Ebenezer had to shut down his business and his five daughters also went to live with Irving. So despite his enormous literary fame, Irving did often struggle financially. Uh, and much of the financial burden of his family's welfare ended up falling on his shoulders. Uh, as a man of influence, he found that it was up to him to leverage favors in order to secure positions for a series of nephews and even his brother, Ebenezer. And here we come to the fateful letter, January 1840. Uh, I know it's impossible to read. Uh, the handwriting is, is very difficult in these old letters, uh, but it says, uh, my dear sir, I'm about to appeal to your friendship in a way I once little dreamed of doing by asking a favor in which my own personal interests are involved. The explanation I shall make in confidence underlined, will I hope plead my apology. I wish to obtain a respectable and reasonably profitable appointment for my brother Ebenezer Irving. The vicissitudes of time have of late years borne hard upon him and his means have been gradually diminishing. I've done all I could to buoy him up and his charming family of daughters have long been the inmates of my cottage. My own means, however, are hampered and locked up so as to produce me no income. And I've, I have had to depend upon the exercise of my pen, daily growing more and more precarious to keep the wolf from the door. As I said before, I make the disclosure to you 
in confidence as a friend. For if I did not think of you from my own heart and believe you to be my friend, you would never have heard from me in this manner. Ever truly yours, Washington Irving. So the Van Buren biographies don't mention Washington Irving as much as the Irving biographies mention Van Buren. Understandable, most of the Van Buren biographies are concerned with his political career. In fact, Van Buren himself had destroyed most of his personal letters and really only kept the ones that pertained to politics. Uh, so we mostly only have Irving's side to consider. Uh, almost all of Washington Irving's correspondence seems to have been preserved. Um, so as far as we know, uh, even after Irving wrote this very heartfelt letter begging for help from his friend, it seems that Van Buren never responded. They even had uh, mutual friends intervene uh, to try to uh, get Ebenezer this position. So we'll likely never know why Van Buren declined to help Ebenezer and Washington. As far as theories go, I've seen it characterized sometimes as a kind of petty tit for tat since Irving had declined to join Van Buren's administration as the Secretary of the Navy. So back in 1838, two years before, Van Buren had written to uh, Washington Irving to, to offer him this position as Secretary of the Navy. Uh, Irving declined the president's offer. In his own words, he said, because, quote, I shrink from the harsh cares and turmoils of public and political life at Washington and feel that I am too sensitive to endure the bitter personal hostility and the slanders and misrepresentations of the press which beset high stations in this country. I really believe it would take but a short career of public life at Washington to render me mentally and physically a perfect wreck and to hurry me premature, prematurely into old age. Permit, permit me then most gratefully to decline the brilliant offer with which your partiality has tempted me but to assure you at the same time that it has served to rivet more strongly that friendship conceived for you, not from benefits conferred or expected, but from an intimate knowledge of your worth. Well, if you read uh, all the letters that are available that Washington Irving sent Martin Van Buren over the years, uh, at least all of the letters you know, that have come down to us two centuries later, then uh, there is, if not an entirely different picture, at least a more nuanced picture of what may have happened emerges. We find that there is a pattern of Irvin, Irving writing and asking for favors for family members. And it seems that Martin Van Buren did in fact help the Irvings out more than once. Uh, for instance, in 1836, Washington Irving had written to President, or sorry, at this time, President-elect, Vice President Van Buren, I'm sorry. I'm quite ashamed to intrude once more upon your friendship in behalf of my nephew, Edgar Irving, but the young fellow looks to me for aid in his difficulties and thinks me a man of infinitely more influence than I am conscious of possessing or meriting. His situation is embarrassing. So Irving actually wrote to Van Buren uh, at least three times about this same nephew, Edgar. He also wrote uh, about another nephew, Theodore. So, oops, uh, perhaps uh, maybe Irving's plea for Ebenezer was uh, the last straw after a decade of favors, or was it just that Martin Van Buren was snowed under with emergencies as president of a country that was financially imploding. This is a political cartoon uh, about the Panic of 1837, which is the second worst financial crisis our country has ever seen. It was uh, second only to the Great Depression. And this is basically something that Martin Van Buren inherits from Jackson, because it's only two months into his presidency uh, when basically the whole world falls apart for him and uh, uh, you know, national financial crisis ensues. So not only you know, is he president, so he's pretty busy, but he also has this terrible financial crisis. Um, he's becoming incredibly unpopular because his people are suffering from, uh, understandably they're, they're blaming him as they suffer from this terrible depression. 
So with this election looming, oh yeah, his reelection is coming up too. Van Buren was under tremendous pressure. So a little bit different than just he refused to answer his friend's letter. If you look at it in the fact that Irving had already requested uh, a few favors at least that we know of and had been granted them and helped out by Van Buren personally uh, as vice president and even as president. So it's hard to get fully behind Irving's assertion uh, that Martin Van Buren had betrayed heartlessness and friendship. But still, uh, whatever the truth of the matter, Irving was devastated and he broke with President Van Buren publicly, endorsing the rival Whig party in the election of 1840. So he comes out in favor of Martin Van Buren's enemy, William Henry Harrison. And in private, he complains bitterly to his friends. So Van Buren and his circle of friends knew well the cause of Irving's defection to the Whigs, as is clear in this excerpt from Captain John Nicholson's letter to President Martin Van Buren in October. He says, quote, I regret to say that I have understood our old friend Irving has got off the fence and shown himself in his true colors by being a Whig and a resident one. He has said an abusive one. I the more deeply regret it as we have at all times looked upon him as a pure and highly honorable man. It is like throwing himself away. It was no doubt because his infirm brother was not placed in the office now filled by Mr. Allen. I understand he complains of your not answering some late letter he addressed to you. This he considers a great grievance and has some idea of demanding back the letter he wrote you. I have not seen Irving and I hope I shall not, although I would like to ask his motives for becoming an opponent to one who has been kind and friendly to him for years past. After this falling out, it'll be 15 years until the two men speak again. And Martin Van Buren, of course, loses his reelection campaign to rival William Henry Harrison, who promptly dies after only 31 days in office. Upon leaving the White House, Van Buren moves into the beautiful castle he'd purchased outside of Kinderhook that had once upon a time given Irving shelter and solace. Van Ness's mansion, Kleinrud, became, became Van Buren's Lindenwald. Irving would then find himself in favor with Harrison's successor, John Tyler, who rewarded him in 1842 with an appointment as minister to Spain for four years a position that Irving gladly accepted. In the intervening years, uh, Martin Van Buren uh, will run for president a couple more times. He acquires some more grandchildren. He tours Europe again, and he renovates and expands Lindenwald, adding the tower and the very fancy Italian portico on the front there. Uh, Irving returned from Spain uh, after four years and took up residence again at his beloved house, Sunnyside, and published several books. Now we fast forward to 1855, a momentous year for both gentlemen. Irving finally published the first of five volumes of his massive biography of George Washington, his namesake. Uh, Irving considered this work his masterpiece. In February of 1855, uh, even if the two men were still estranged, the two families were united when one of Irving's grand nieces, Henrietta Eckford Irving, married Smith Thompson Van Buren, the president's youngest son. Uh, Martin Van Buren did not attend as he was in Europe at the time with his third son, Martin Jr., who was suffering terribly from consumption. They had gone to Europe to seek treatment. They had heard that the doctors in Europe uh, were onto something, which was not true and is sad, but they were in Europe at the time. Irving, however, was at the wedding, and he wrote, he described it in a letter to a friend of his. The wedding took place in Grace Church, which seemed half filled with relatives and connections, 
I counted 18 nieces and grandnieces, great and small, among those present of my kith and kin. But on the heels of this joyful union came tragedy. The president's third son, Martin Van Buren Jr., died uh, the next month in March after a long struggle uh, with tuberculosis. His father was there with him in Paris. Uh, Martin Van Buren had already lost his wife, Hannah, and two daughter-in-laws to tuberculosis. We actually have a rare personal letter that Van Buren sent to his lifelong friend, Francis Preston Blair, about this time. Uh, it's in the Blair family papers, which is why it most likely escaped being burned by Van Buren. Uh, part of the letter is he quote, he writes, quote, the last result is constantly before my eyes and cannot be disguised. And I fear much longer delayed. Martin bears all with a steadiness and a firmness seldom equaled and never exceeded. A silent tear occasionally is all that is seen or heard by way of complaint. And poor Martin Jr. died just three days after Martin Van Buren penned this letter. The president was very grieved, but he was also inspired by this loss to rededicate himself to working on his autobiography, which Martin Jinger had been making preparations for by helping his father organize his correspondence and papers. He reflected on those tumultuous years of the 1830s leading up to his presidency and was reminded of his old friend Irving. In the autobiography, he does publish a couple of letters from Irving. Uh, from this time period. So not long after, the president actually extends an olive branch and invites Washington Irving to visit him at Lindenwald. Of course, we don't have Martin Van Buren's invitation to Irving, but we do have Irving's reply. Uh, I got a copy of it from the Library of Congress. It says, September 4th, 1855, my dear sir, it gives me great pleasure to accept your kind invitation to Lindenwald. If the weather should not prevent, I shall take the train on Friday next, which arrives at Stuyvesant about two o'clock. Yours very truly, Washington Irving. After nearly half a century, the world-renowned author returned to the house where he'd been so inspired while writing his first book. And here's a newspaper clipping uh, from the time. This distinguished author recently made a visit to ex-president Van Buren at Lindelwall, misspelled, where he spent a few days very pleasantly with a friend of his. Uh, and then the mansion of the ex-president was once occupied and owned by the late judge William P. Van Ness and whose family, Mr. Irving, was a private tutor. And here he penned the first of those popular works, which have acquired for him an undying fame and shed a luster on his country. More than half a century has elapsed since he passed the threshold of the venerable mansion, which he has just revisited to enter upon the brilliant career to which has made his name illustrious and shine more brightly in the sunset of his existence. So we come full circle. I would love to know what their conversation was during this visit. I can imagine them in the beautiful dining hall of uh, Lindenwald um, at that remarkable table, if you've been there. It's a beautiful mahogany table surrounded by uh, that amazing uh, wallpaper, this uh, mural, French mural by Zubel. And I'm sure they must have had uh, a great time reminiscing. Uh, who knows if they uh, rehashed old events or merely just reminisced. Uh, but alas, I have found no letters describing it. Like so much of history, it will remain a mystery and we shall have to be content knowing that the old friends did end up making peace. So Irving then dies a few years later in 1859 at the age of 76, and Martin Van Buren dies in 1862 at 79. Uh, as a nice postscript to the story, after the deaths of both her father-in-law, Martin Van Buren, and her husband, Smith Thompson Van Buren, 
Henrietta Irving Van Buren is sort of the last man standing. She will become the steward of Martin Van Buren's legacy. Uh, she is actually the one who presents the president's papers and autobiography to the Library of Congress. And so we all owe a debt to Henrietta Irving Van Buren for uh, preserving and presenting the American people with uh, the Van Buren papers. There we go. There we go. Okay. So now we're back. And that is the story gleaned uh, almost entirely from the letters of Washington Irving, um, which I've gathered from lots of different sources, the Library of Congress, as well as uh, the autobiography. I'm sorry, the, there's a couple of uh, books that uh, published the entire uh, like body of Irving's letters. Um, so kind of cobbled together this, this story that I think is somewhat forgotten, uh, but is really interesting and gives us sort of this uh, really personal insight into uh, who, someone who I really didn't realize how important Washington Irving was uh, to America and to our, our literary history. Um, uh, that he also was very intimately involved uh, with the politics at the time. Uh, so yeah, that's our story. And let's see, does anybody have any, any questions or thoughts about it? And a couple of people pointed out that the chat was not working earlier, but I believe it is working now. So feel free to post your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, either one. Um, and I'll just let you guys know if you're still thirsty for more. I've collected uh, all of the letters, um, almost every letter that Washington Irving ever, ever wrote Van Buren and some other peripheral letters. Um, so they're in a binder at the Martin Van Buren National Historic Site. In our visitor center for the month of October, we have uh, sort of a special exhibit uh, about what, just exactly what I just talked about. Um, so you could come and read in depth all the letters yourself and come to your own conclusions about what you think might have happened. Oh, Mike, no question, but thanks for the interesting story from Fort Smith, Arkansas. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Thanks for tuning in. Sorry, you won't be able to make it probably to the exhibits in our visitors center, but uh, please follow us on Facebook. We're, we're posting stuff this, this month of, about Washington Irving. <laughs> the gambling, yeah. People love that. Um, it is an apocryphal story that, uh, see, sorry, Jason, Jason writes this. Um, yeah, some people uh, like to tell the story that, so after Martin Van Buren died, he dies in 1862 in, in Lindenwald in the house. And uh, two years later, his sons sell the property. And there is a great story that John Van Buren, uh, the son that I mentioned, who went on the tour with Washington Irving and Van Buren, actually lost the house while he was gambling with uh, Winston Churchill's grandfather. Uh, and uh, there's no, we don't have any evidence either way. Um, we know that Winston Churchill's grandfather is, is the one who purchased uh, the house. And so um, when she's about 15 year, years old, Winston Churchill's mom, Jenny Jerome, um, does live at Lindenwald briefly. Um, but yeah, it's a great story. And, and John, uh, John Van Buren was, was known to uh, have sort of a profligate lifestyle. So it's not entirely out of character that he might have uh, lost the home in a bet. Uh, but yeah, we don't, we don't have any evidence of that. The petticoat scandal. Sure. I'll tell you a little bit about that. David writes, um, like I said, it's a big, huge, interesting story that we could have a whole talk on, but the basics of it are, um, in Jackson's administration in his cabinet, in his cabinet, he had, um, uh, one of his cabinet members, um, was Eaton, this man named Eaton. So it's also known as the Eaton Affair. Um, and his wife was Margaret, uh, 
Eaton, sorry, but known as Peggy Eaton. And she, there was some hint of impropriety in that maybe she had, uh, I mean, mostly I think most egregiously what had really happened is that they had not had a proper mourning time before they married after her first husband died. But there was also some scandal and some people like to cast aspersions on her character. And so when she uh, came to Washington with Eaton, the other members of the cabinet's wives uh, didn't always want to receive her. And this was led by um, Calhoun's wife, Florida Calhoun, uh, who was the vice president. So her wife, uh, sorry, so she actually really leads this sort of boycott of the Eatons and won't receive them in, in the drawing rooms of Washington. And this leads to a big schism in Jackson's cabinet, actually. Uh, and in the end, it's actually Martin Van Buren who comes out on top. He does not have a wife. He, has a, he is a widower. And so he does not have... Um, like really a dog in this or a horse in this race um so but he gets to come out looking like the hero because he set, stays above it all and he resigns from jackson's cabinet and then because he resigns he's the secretary of state the rest of the cabinet all resigns and then jackson is free to build a whole new cabinet with people who are giving him a really hard time uh, yeah, so that's the the notes, nuts and bolts of the petticoat affair. Uh, but it's a really interesting uh, look. We, we could look at that through a feminist lens of um, these women who did not have the right to vote uh, were still were exercising whatever power they happened to have, which was was mostly just social capital. Um, these wealthy women. So uh, yeah, that's a really interesting story. Yes, John Van. Sorry, Virginia writes. John Van Buren was the New York State Attorney General, just like his dad had been. <laughs> Sorry to hear about the unflattering portrait of him. Um, yeah, he, he's the son who ends up being most like his father. He becomes a politician and a lawyer, and he's one of the founding members of the Free Soil Party, uh, which Martin Van Buren ends up running uh, for president with the Free Soil Party for his fourth and final uh, run for president. Elizabeth says, I worked at Sunnyside many years ago, but never knew the details of the friendship with Van Buren. Uh, so yeah, more about the exhibition. It's a small pop-up exhibition just for the month of October. We have a brand new uh, visitor center that was uh, redone during the pandemic and has been, we don't have a store right now. So I used the space, you know, me and uh, some coworkers used it to put up this exhibit. And it's mostly exactly what we talked about here. It's about Washington Irving and his connections with Van Buren and with the site Lindenwald. Um, so it just is a little bit more in depth than, than this talk has been. And then um, I, you also can go through a, a sort of our research for, about the exhibit. Uh, in August, no, so sorry, the, the exhibit just went up October 1st. Uh, and so this is the first thing we've had in the visitor center in a few years. Uh, and it'll be there for the month of October. I don't see any more questions. Um, we can wait a little bit longer if anybody has questions, just put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Thank you, William. That's nice. You guys, this was really fun. Um, I am really interested in bringing out these sort of maybe lesser known stories. I think there's obviously very important work being done about uh, Martin Van Buren's uh, politics and his, his, the way he shaped uh, our modern political system. But there's also so many interesting, um, you know, cultural sort of cul-de-sacs that we can go down uh, that are related to Van Buren and the time period in the house. Um, and I really love exploring those. And like I said, uh, they feel like little mysteries. And um, it's really fun to tease out these new wrinkles and stories we think have already been told. Cool. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, Ellen. All right, Tammy. I, I think okay. Um, yeah, it, we have no more questions. I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, some people asked about archiving it. We have recorded it and we will be posting this on the Columbia County Library's website, brand new website that hasn't quite officially launched yet, but we'll send out the link to everybody who signed up for this program. And anybody who wants can come by and see me at the site. And uh, I, I'm there five days a week giving tours.